My text is in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and Paul did not have a biological son, but he sure had a lot of spiritual sons. Amen? And um, it says in 2 Timothy 2, Thou therefore what? My son. And what does he want his son to do? Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And I believe it's the Lord's will that all of our sons and the ones that he will bring to us in the future will be strong in the grace of God. He says in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That doesn't sound effeminate, does it? Endure hardness. That doesn't sound like Christianity is uh, something plastic and feeble. He says in verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. That's very important. Consider that as we look at verse 12. If we suffer... If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. That's the coming prize of millennial glory. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. So there is correction and there is responsibility. There is accountability. And it's very important. If we're going to be men and we're going to raise manly sons. Dear Father, we do ask that You be with the teaching, the preaching of Thy Holy Bible. Father, we live in perilous times with much confusion, much weakness, Lord. And we do pray that we'll be strong in Your grace, Lord. That we'll do our part to yield unto You and walk in that strength that You have for us, that manliness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you look at your notes, I've written this out for you. And we'll be preaching upon it as we make our way through this part one. The world in our country are in increasing turmoil and impending danger. That's obvious in so many ways. This study on raising manly sons may at first appear to be ignoring the, quote, important issues around us. For example, I'm reminded of James R. Graves, the great Southern Baptist leader. He was criticized by some for writing about the subject of men wearing beards in the midst of the Civil War crisis. And uh, people look back upon him and say, what was he doing discussing such a thing? And But you know, if something's in the Bible, and, and I know that uh, there were great debates between Graves and Pendleton about the South and the North, so it's not like he ignored the issue. But he felt that if something's in the Bible and it relates to manliness, he expected that it would be worthy of discussion even in the midst of the Civil War. Uh, I know he was for beards. I can't remember his arguments. I'm sure he was just saying it's expedient for men to have them. Certainly Joseph uh, shaved as a witness to Pharaoh, and uh, you might need to do so for jobs. Well, we, we never discussed that around here. Uh, that's not my subject today. But it is interesting that many times when you bring up certain things in the Bible... Uh, people basically want to say, uh, I don't think God cares about this or that. And what I believe is God cares about whatever He revealed to us, He cares about. Instead of imagining what God thinks and how God feels, I think the only way I can ever know how God thinks or how He feels is by looking at the record that He gave me of how He thinks and feels. And therefore, I think God cares about the things. You know what he says right here in Luke chapter 16, that the things that man esteems are an abomination to him. So his ways are not our ways, and that's just something I want to throw out. I'm not ignorant, and I know we're not ignorant of the times we're living in, and we're not ignoring the dangers of our times. We as a church are busy working and praying toward the accomplishment of our vision, our goals for relocation. And that's whether by translation to glory, Luke 21, 36. I hope you have your eyes on that. Watch and pray always. You may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. That's important, is it not? Or if the Lord does not come, 
They moved to the Missouri Hills. So my point is, is we're not just putting our head in the sand, unaware of what's coming to America. Uh, we're doing what we can, and um, certainly we're open to doing more. But I believe that if we get so caught up in the affairs of this life that we forget spiritual things, and we forget to seek first the kingdom of God, so all these other things shall be added unto us, I believe we greatly err. I believe we greatly err. People say, why don't you do something important? I believe studying the Bible is important. I believe raising godly, manly children for Jesus, I believe that is important. Furthermore, regardless of what happens in America, the situation will call for great manliness, right? So I believe my study relates to our situation today in America. Satan and his servants are laboring to weaken men and boys and to corrupt them into homosexual perversion. One day, I'm going to gather all this material and material from other sermons and research that I've done and put it in a book uh, about the androgyny agenda and sum this thing up and pray for me that the Lord would enable me to get that out. But um, I'm going to touch upon some of this today. I want you to know that Satan and his servants are laboring to weaken men and boys and to corrupt them into homosexual perversion. And he is succeeding in Baptist churches, fundamental churches across America, conservative churches. He's succeeding. He's accomplishing his goals. And where he cannot make you a homosexual... He is at least attempting to make you effeminate and passive. Therefore, we must not ignore such spiritual moral dangers, since neglecting them is often at the root of the other problems we face. Much that is wrong with America today. People say, well, you ought to be concentrating upon this or that, and they think of some of the things that are wrong with America. And really, what I'm trying to say is, right now, if you would concentrate on raising godly, manly sons, some of these things would fix themselves. Many who have a platform of influence today ignore these spiritual foundational dangers. They're not politically correct. Or they barely make mention of them. Or maybe casually they'll make a remark here or there. Certainly God has revealed to us in the Scriptures how political liberty is the fruit of not merely our own vigilance, but God's mercy and pleasure. And He may remove this liberty from any people as a rod of correction. He removed it from the Jews in the days of Jeremiah. And there were many that were liberty-minded that looked at Jeremiah and his warning to the nation that they're under discipline. And they looked at Jeremiah and what he said sounded like defeat. What he said was horrible for a Jew. They said, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. We have the privileges. We're the people of God. How dare you say that we're going to serve another nation? And great charismatic leaders, uh, false prophets would stand up and they would break these yokes and said, this is what God's going to do to anybody that comes against America. We need unity at this time. And it was peace, peace. Basically, we can do it. But it was not liberty through repentance. Do you understand that? They were not willing to repent before God. And we need to understand that God may remove liberty from many people as a rod of correction. I, I thought of Nehemiah chapter 9 that I read the other day. I'd like you to just consider what he says here. It's powerful scripture. Nehemiah 9, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their back. That's what's happening today. 
I mean, there's a lot of that moral law in that Old Testament that's for us today. And of course, there's New Testament law. There's, there's all types of commandments. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And they're all throughout the New Testament. And people today, Christians, the light of the world, are casting these behind their back. Therefore, thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies. There it is right there. How plain can you get in the Bible? Who vex them. And in the time of their trouble, when they cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven, and according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors, who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. Isn't God good? But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore leftest thou them in the hand of their enemies, so that they had the dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, thou heardest them from heaven. And many times did thou deliver them according to thy what? Mercies. And testifiest against them that thou mightest bring them again unto what? Thy law. There's the point. There it is right there. What does God say about things? How does God view homosexuality? How does God view marriage? How does God view all of these things? That's what matters. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. There it is. There's the principle right there. You walk in God's judgments, you'll live. You refuse them and cast them behind your back, you're going to die. There it is, right there. And a nation will die the same way. I want you to notice, verse 30, yet many years, many years did thou forbear them. Oh, this is starting to sound like America, isn't it? And testify us against them by thy spirit and thy prophets. Yet would not they, yet would not they give ear. Therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. What happens to a nation? You don't... T I'm going to tell you something, folks. Hyper-dispensationalists say, well, that's only to Israel. And I know they had a covenant. I know they had special covenant. But the God of the Bible says in Psalms 9, the wicked shall be turned into hell. Did he just say that's in Israel? He said, and all the nations that forget God. In other words, God works this same way with every nation. Liberty is a blessing and mercy from God. You know what's interesting? Every one of our founding fathers of our country said this. They all said that. They, they said this is for a moral people. This republic will only stay in place for a moral people. If you forget God's law and God's rules and natural law and cast it behind your back, you can wave bye-bye to your country. And what I'm saying, why don't we remember the words of our founding fathers? I think it's time for us to remember that there needs to be a great repentance in America. All right. I said all that to just simply say, studying biblical morality, studying what God expects of Christian men and Christian fathers, it's not ignoring the situation in our country. In fact, I'm concentrating on the situation in our country. In a recent sermon, we mentioned the late 19th century attempt by many to correct the imbalance in Sunday school literature that's in the 19th century. We studied how, quote, Christian art and etc. was effeminate and really came right out of the pit of paganism. In Sunday school material of the, seven, of the 19th century, feminine virtues had been exalted over masculine virtues. I've studied this material because I wanted good reading material for my little girls. And I wanted nothing that was filled with liberalism and psychobabble of the, especially the second half of the 20th century. So I always went back to the 19th century Sunday school and a lot of precious things there. Wonderful material. No psychobabble, no evolution, no mess, uh, all King James Bible stuff. It's just wonderful stuff. But I started noticing the feminine virtues. It's a little lopsided. And boys were raised with constant stories about flowers and being nice. 
And the more you read it, the more you realize, praise God, it's not full of psychobabble, but there's an imbalance here. There's little to inspire boys to courage and pluck and determination, initiative, decisiveness, vigor, assertiveness, confrontation, and all the other things boys need to protect their sisters and grow up to protect and provide for their own families spiritually and physically. Now, don't get the idea that the 19th century was just filled with effeminate people. Uh, some of the pioneer preachers like Peter Cartwright, I, I meant, you know, some woman starts preaching right in the middle of his sermon and standing up and ignoring him. He'll stop the sermon, go over and pick her up with her screaming and everything, put her out the door, lock the church and come back and start preaching again. That's how they were. He's a pioneer preacher. You understand? And so they, they filled this land with manly preaching and that type of thing. So, And not only that, but when you listen to the, not the Peter Cartwrights, but if you listen to the nice preachers of that day, the city preachers, if you heard them today, people would faint. Uh, I mean, people just, they, they couldn't handle it. Uh, I mean, the nice fellows were so stern that it's, uh, that it's amazing. Anybody can read things from that generation and see that uh, we're in a mess today. We are in a mess. Uh, Nevertheless, there was this movement to glorify, at the expense of masculinity, the feminine virtue. And by 1910, a YMCA survey found that two-thirds of church members in the United States were female. Much the situation today. Some might say it's because in the Bible they're the better sex, and that's true, because the Bible says in Romans 1 that even their women, and women are going bad right now. They're going real bad. And uh, that's a sign that you're pretty much hitting bottom. But people were trying to correct this imbalance. They're trying to say, where are our men in 1910? The survey from the YMCA, interestingly... YMA, YMCA history, I'm not endorsing everything about the Young Men's Christian Association, but um, it was started as an inner city place for kids to study the Bible. That was the goal. It really had nothing to do with athletics or anything. But the more the leaders of the YMCA started looking at society, they realized, you know, our inner city kids, they're not... They don't have any work to do. They don't have anything. Uh, and they're starting to become effeminate. So they wanted to put a gym and a place for these boys to start working out. And they started concentrating on spirit, soul, and body, and strength, and, and, and activity, and, and that type of thing. And uh, interestingly, I witnessed the change, at least where I was in South Carolina, growing up as a as a camper and then finally as a camp counselor in the YMCA movement of, of, of South Carolina, I remember Coach Gatch and he ran it like an army. Uh, I meant you had a bugle call and, and, the, and the children were challenged. It, it was amazing stuff. And uh, he inspired manliness and, and you would have hundreds of children, but, but the, the boys that overcame and were manly and not shy, he exalted them and praised them. And, and if you cried and wanted to go home to mama, you, you were chastised. I mean, it was, it was pretty brutal for, for a boy. But you know what it did was after a few days, you just kind of woke up and you got with the program. And, but hey, guess what? That didn't survive very long. It began to change, and I witnessed the whole change and the whole psychobabble movement come in and the whole self-esteem movement. And, and, uh, so, and, of course, now it's called the Y. Certainly not the Young Men's Christian Association, and it's, there's nothing Christian hardly left in it anymore. Um, looking back... There was a reaction to some of this imbalance in the 19th century as they stressed the feminine virtues 
Some men decided we need to fix this. This is wrong. So they launched what's called the Muscular Christianity Movement. Of course, that was a name given to it mainly by its uh, detractors. And the more they talked about manliness and muscular Christianity and adopted the names that these people are giving them, um, the more that set them up. So any time there was an extreme example or somebody misused their power or they get report of some preacher horse whipping somebody that was backslidden, you know, and, and they would put that in the news, just like today, you know. Uh, if, if you talk about fathers spanking their children and being good fathers, suddenly they're going to put on the news somebody that's just gone crazy, you know. And uh, if you talk about men being strong men in their home, uh, then suddenly they're going to put wife beaters and they're going to put them all up in the news. And you know how this works. Uh, the goal is to uh, demonize in a very unbalanced way anything having to do with masculinity. This muscular Christianity movement was a reaction to influences that were producing this imbalance, just as fundamentalism arose to combat the so-called higher criticism. It involved a Christian commitment to spiritual holiness, which included physical health. It is defined by others, even today, as a Christian commitment to health and manliness. It focused on the need for zealous evangelism connected with a vigorous masculinity. Many books were written along this line. I've mentioned some in previous sermons. I'll mention a few today. Men like Charles Kingsley, who died in 1875, and Thomas Hughes, who died in 1896. They were sportsmen, and they were advocates of a rigorous life, a strenuous life. Hughes was the author of True Manliness. He defined manliness as moral courage, not merely athleticism. That's important for you to understand. These men weren't saying, just go get muscles and you'll be a good Christian. That's not what they were saying. They were just saying, let's love God with our whole body. And this idea that to be a Christian, you have to be some effeminate person with no backbone. How is that contending and standing and doing all that God wants us to do? How is that creating godly, masculine sons? These men believe that asceticism and effeminacy had weakened churches and men in general. Several books were written that blossomed at the same time fundamentalism blossomed in its stand against compromise and liberalism. One of these books was titled Athletes of the Bible, 1922. That's just an example of a long series of books that came out this book explored the life of David, showing how he had physical skill and great strength. David was called a man of war even as a youth before he slew Goliath. He had a rugged outdoor life, didn't he? Yet he also possessed the crucial moral attributes. David prayed often. David had great skill in music. He was a poet. He cultivated close, quality friendships. It sounds like David was balanced, does it not? Or put it this way, it sounds like being a godly man and being a real man does not mean that you have no relationship with Jesus. This idea that, well, if you're going to be religious and go to church, you're a wimp and you're effeminate and you have no backbone and you're just a slacker, that's not true. I mean, look at David. And so what these books tried to do is point out, look at the physical attributes of David. Look at his strength. Look at his ruggedness. As well as the fact that he was a man after God's own heart. And it's good to show children even today that getting up here and singing for Jesus... That's manly. Singing for Jesus is manly.
in the later 1920s. Of course, anytime you have a move trying to restore, you're going to have a counter move to try to discourage the rebuilding. You can read the book of Nehemiah. You can see how when they began to rebuild, Sanballat came out, did everything he can to try to discourage the restoration, the rebuilding. Uh, I pointed out that after World War II, when the women began to return back to the homes, the communists set up Betty Friedan and had her write a book, pretend she was a housewife, and basically convinced all the women that you're miserable, and they launched the second wave of the feminist movement there. And so you're always going to have, any time you have Christians reacting and waking up to what the devil's doing, and they come and they say, we need to rebuild this over here. These walls are busted down. We need to restore the ancient past. We need to restore the old past. And what happens is that many times, in fact, I'll say every time, the devil's going to come out and try to shut down the rebuilding. And he's going to attack it with all the wrath that he could muster. So when these men began to wake up, and all of these books were written inspiring a masculine Christianity in the days of the fundamentalist movement, which was contending for the faith. People were saying, well, you know, we're going to get together with our churches. We're going to fund Baylor and these other colleges. And, but yet there are evolutionists in the colleges. And men begin to wake up and say, what are we doing? Why are we funding the brainwashing of our children into this liberalism? And so they began to rebuke it and began to stand and contend. And, and, and the, I tell you what, that's a nightmare for the devil. Do you understand that? Not only were they contending theologically, but they began to raise up their boys and inspire them to be men, to be courageous, quit being wimps. So... Welcome to the 1920s, Harry Emerson Fosdick, funded by the Rockefellers and their New World Order agenda. Fosdick's brother was also funded by Rockefeller, and he confessed that I'm working to bring forth a world government. He said it. Suddenly, Fosdeck gets all of this money. He's on the front page of papers across America. He's known as the liberal preacher. And he began to attack not only the very fundamentals of Christianity, the virgin birth, the second coming, the blood atonement, the inspiration of the Bible. He began to attack fundamentalism. He began to launch a war against fundamentalism. But that's not all. He attacked muscular Christianity. And he began to demonize it and make fun of it. Now listen, I don't believe the promise keepers were very muscular theologically. You understand that? But it, it, was, it is a reaction. It was a reaction trying to restore some degree of accountability. Even that little bit of effort that they put forth to restore masculinity, you ought to see how the media labeled it. They did the same thing Fosdick did. They made fun of it. They demonized it. And um, But it wasn't just the Rockefeller-funded Fosdick. Novelists such as Sinclair Lewis who envisioned a secular America and was called Satan's cohort by Billy Sunday, also ridiculed masculine Christianity. He began to write these novels, making fun and uh, turning them into hypocrites and demonizing masculine Christianity. By the 1930s, the criticism continued in the neo-Orthodox heresies of Reinhold 
Niebuhr and all these other so-called liberal Protestant preachers. Then, of course, you know that Hollywood and rock music and feminism, along with the humanism in public schools, buried what was left of biblical masculinity. Not to mention wars that came in and wipe out whole generations of at least men that knew how to work and have backbone. So, you're left with this vacuum in America and this assault of propaganda against anything having to do with traditional masculinity. Now, I want to say... Without the priority of faith in God and obedience to Him, physical health, sports, so-called manliness are all profane. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> if you're not going to read the Bible and be a godly Christian and pray and stand for God, what in the world is taking care of your body going to do for your soul? Like Harry Esau, the hunter. I mean, he wasn't a mama's boy, was he? I mean, that's why his daddy liked him. Boy, you go out there, he looked manly, he talked manly. And he goes out there and shoots the deer that his daddy liked. But there was a problem with Esau. He was athletic. In one sense, he was manly, but he was profane. When people cuss, they call it profanity. There's a reason, because you're saying things as if there's no God. That's what profane means. Esau lived like there was no God. There's a lot of good old boys all across America. Shotguns in their pickup truck, and I tell you, but they live like there's no God. And you better believe country music and anything that they're doing whatever they can to use these forms of propaganda to come in. And we could go through the whole uh, movies that are put out showing cowboys that are homosexual. We could talk about the whole Western wear culture where you walk into a Fort Worth store and every single shirt has pink flowers on it, lavender, everything. I mean, you don't know what the girl section is from the boy section. And you begin to realize this is all by design. And I've contended with the store owners. I said, well, I don't understand this. Why does this look like the girl section? And they love to say, well, we're man enough to wear it. And I said, okay, well, here's a ribbon. Why don't you stick it inside your hair if you're man enough? Put your skirt on. Show me how manly you are by sticking this ribbon in your hair. I absolutely told him. That's what I told him. So without God, without prioritizing, and we'll talk about Esau and Jacob here in a moment, but I want you to notice that if the plowing of the wicked is sin, Proverbs 21.4, how much more the exercising of the wicked? You boys listening in the back? If the plowing of the wicked is sin, how much more the exercising of the wicked? And how about the playing of the wicked? I mean, plowing, at least you're working. And God says, you get out there and plow without me. You just forget me. You're not doing it for me and to me and through me and with me. It's sin. How much more getting out here and trying to build your body and exercise and play sports, but there's no God. That's what happened to America. See, what happened is... Many people, all these sports, volleyball, all of these, uh, baseball, bat, all these things were invented in the context of trying to say, we don't want any children that are wimps anymore. We want them to be men. We want you to get out of here and, and learn some competition and sport. It, it all had a pretty good beginning. At least their motives were right. But you know what they finally decided? We'll keep basketball and get rid of God. <laughs> we'll keep the sports. 
We like that and say bye to God. And our forefathers never intended that. They never intended what you see here in America, what they call manliness, is somebody putting their feet up in their out of shape body and sitting in front of that TV with a remote control, calling themselves a man because they like to see people slamming their heads together and breaking their bones. And then showing the cheerleaders every now and then as he asks his wife to bring him a Budweiser. That's not manliness. And the forefathers of America never intended that to be manliness. You understand that? But our Baptist churches, I was listening to a fundamental preacher from the 1970s, and he says, I promise my sermon won't be long, and we put a TV out here. It was a big fundamentalist church of America. He says, we put a TV right out here in the foyer, and any time while I'm preaching, you men need to go out there and see the game. Y'all run out there and see the score while I preach. I heard him with my own ear. I about ran off the road. I'm like, this is how I ended up in an America like this. These were the fundamentalists. Modern America has simply rediscovered the barbarism of the ancient Roman circus. And there are evil men who have used this worship of sports as a distraction so men will continue in passivity. Remember Brave New World where they get them all into the sports and things to, as a form of hypnotizing them into passivity so they can be controlled? You don't think people that own prisons and run prisons, you don't think they understand this concept? Interestingly, Rome's love of the barbaric, bloody circus was a symptom of its growing effeminacy. Charles Kingsley even called it effeminate barbarism. That's interesting. Putting those two together, effeminate barbarism. Paul in 2 Timothy 3 also, through inspiration, says that in the last days they will be selfish lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That doesn't sound very manly, does it? But he also says they will be fierce. They will be wild, rushing, savage. These punks that will shoot you for nothing. You know, it used to be in the old days, you know, and I'm not saying it's right, but two fellas having an argument on the side of the road, they'll get out and have some words together. I'm not saying that's very Christian, but at least, you know, they can have two words. Nowadays, you walk up to somebody's window and say, man, you just about killed my little girl. I got a family. They'll shoot you right there the, on the street. And that's not manly. You understand that? Police officers, many of them are not manly. The dog was about to bite me. I had to shoot it. The fella came at me. I mean, it's just, just crazy what's going on all around America. And this savage, barbaric fierceness is effeminate. It's not manly. They're not mutually exclusive. Meaning if you're a barbarian, that doesn't mean that you're manly and that you're not effeminate. I'm telling you that you're barbaric... You are a feminine, just maybe in a different form. In another place, Kingsley writes about the fall of Rome. Listen to what he says. This is interesting. This is from the works of Charles Kingsley, 1887. The only god was the Caesar, the imperial demigod. The palace was a sink of corruption. The free middle class had disappeared or lingered in the cities too proud to labor fed on government bounty and amused by government spectacles. Isn't that something? Slave owners spent their lives in the cities, luxurious and effeminate. So, according to Kingsley and many others, the fall of Rome was because of their effeminacy. But yet they like sports, they like gladiator contests, they love to see violence and blood, but Kingsley and many other observers, even historians, and philosophers are arguing that Rome had become effeminate. And what I'm saying is to equate what America calls manliness with true manliness, there's just something wrong with that. Therefore, we must not react to the modern situation, which is the worship of sports, 
in a manner that fails to realize that there is a higher historical battle against all the evil forms of effeminacy and passivity in man. What I'm telling you is it's wrong to look out here and say everybody's worshiping sports. We have competition. We have all of this. And so what I'm going to do is retreat and I'm going to make sure my boy never plays any sport. Now, I understand if you don't want to get out of here playing with the heathen and learning their ways and things. But there's a reaction in many Christian circles and they're saying, no. I've seen the abuse of all of this, and I'm going to make sure my boy never, never goes down. That He's not going to do anything physical. Do you see how warped that is? That's, I come from a bad music background where, where we abuse music and, uh, and had music for the sake of music and, and, and kept God out of it. And, and actually, I didn't want my daughters to even play an instrument. Do you see how I was reacting? And, and so I had to realize, okay, music is a gift of God. You need to be careful how we use it. We need to keep it in its place. But it's not music that's bad. It's the perversion of music without God. Many men come from a background that, where you had fierce competition and you had all that dog-eat-dog -dog world of combat and competition and sports. And I've seen many men like that retreat and not even let kids compete at all. <laughs> you see what they're doing? They're saying, no, competition is bad. Everybody has to win or we're not going to play. And I've asked men like that. I've said, why are you doing that? And they said, I've, I've been in that world of competition. See, my point is, let's not create false dichotomies. Let's not create a situation where you say, if it's not this, it has to be this. That's like people that say, well, if it's not lose your salvation, it has to be, well, everybody just gets awarded by Jesus and everybody's happy. Well, that's a false dichotomy. Just like it's a false dichotomy to say, if we're not going to have rock and roll, sensual, ungodly worship, we need to just get rid of all music. That's a false dichotomy. For example, many observe the Whole Foods, environmentalist, hippie, New Age, sodomite culture. You know what they say? Pastors all across America, Christians all across America. They decide that the proper response to that culture is a reckless, slothful, gluttonous life that abuses the body. That's a false dichotomy. Do you understand? People say, oh, you're one of them. New. It's like when I called up, see, see I, when I was on 660, I, I basically set it up. I said, you're not going to paint me as a tree hugger. So the first thing I said is, I'm not an environmentalist or a tree hugger. But you're saying that people care more about bees than they care about human life. And I'm telling you, that's a foolish statement. And if your bees die, buddy, the whole thing crashes. But see, what they want to do today is paint you. If you're against mosquito spraying... You are a tree hugger, new age, pantheist witch. No, 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 wait a second. What if I'm not a hippie, not a new ager, not an environmentalist in the way they, I believe in stewardship of the earth. I believe man was created to have dominion. And with all dominion comes responsibility. But I believe that we ought to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, according to Mark chapter 12, avoiding every imbalance. And if we're going to love Him with our strength, that includes our body and taking care of the temple of the Holy Ghost and not defiling it and letting it run down. People say, well, you're just going to be martyred. You just need to give it to Jesus anyway. Well, I know if that's true and God calls for that, then let's give God a body that we haven't abused and run down. You know, Paul, when he's about to get his head cut off, said, why don't you bring me my coat? 
Well, why, why do you need a coat? You're going to get your head cut off. I believe Paul said, I, I'm going to take care of my body the best I can. So when I offer it to Jesus, it won't be something I've abused with my own carnality. You understand? Not only that, he might get out of prison. He said he had great hope that he's going to get relief. And many historians believe he did get out for a time. You don't know what God's going to do. God might have many things for you to do for Him. So we need to take care of our bodies. So I'm getting tired of going around the country and listening to Baptists get up and say, if it's not greasy, if it's not sugary, if it's not uh, whatever, 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 it ain't food. And seeing the whole congregation roar and get all happy, I think it's irresponsible. I think it's ridiculous. And all you have created, all you have discovered, is really the early... Gnostic asceticism of the monks and nuns. You know what they decided? They said the body doesn't matter. Read First John. That's what they were saying. And you can read the writings of the early church fathers for the first 300 years and see they were contending against this Gnostic idea. The Gnostics say you don't have to fear God. You can do anything in your body. It doesn't matter. Because what's important is the spirit, said the Gnostic ascetics. Spiritual, that's all that matters. Who cares about your body? Be a glutton. Be a fornicator. It doesn't matter. That's what they were saying. Now, today, they're not saying necessarily just go live in fornication and adultery. Some of them do say that uh, in their theology. But what they are saying is you can just be a glutton. You can be unhealthy. It doesn't matter. There's no spirituality or morality whatsoever in abusing your body. And that's just not true. You've created a false dichotomy that if you're not a hippie tree hugger, that therefore you need to be a glutton. And the whole South is now known for people that are dying, people with diabetes and strokes and, and all of those problems. And they mock it. The world mocks it. The Bible Belt. They mock it. I don't believe it's a very good witness for Jesus. Y'all listening? We spent some time in earlier sermons documenting the occult agenda to feminize boys and rob girls of their classic femininity. Apocryphal gospels of early Gnostics were revived by Blavatsky, the great occult leader and other occultists of the 19th century, to usher in a new age of bisexuality, androgyny, etc. This corresponds to the so-called coming of the Aquarian age in astrology. Believe me, when they started singing, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and you looked out and you realized, wow... All these men have hair like women. And they said, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Do you know what they were talking about? They didn't just decide, wow, long hair's cool. No, androgyny, pagan androgyny. We are taking masculinity and we are blurring it. So it's half man, half woman. All the lead singers, Led Zeppelin, they got... What is Led Zeppelin? A lead flying floating thing. That's a contradiction, isn't it? Well, that's because masculinity and femininity were being put together in a man that sits up and, and he has the power of that rock music, but he wears women's clothes. And he sings like a woman. He looks like a woman. He acts like a woman. You have this mixture, and all these men are like, yeah, yeah, this is great, this is great, this is manly. Wait a minute. Is he a woman or is he a man? And then you start listening to the lead singers, and they begin to write articles. Uh, Dee Snyder, and they begin to say, all rock music is bisexual. It's all the ultimate androgynous male. There it is. And if you think rap's manly, you got another thing coming. It's all about blurring the distinction between the sexes. So June Singer's Androgyny in 1976, she writes a book called Androgyny, 1976. Listen to what she says. Androgyny may indeed be the guiding principle of the New Age. There it is. I've said it for years. Astrologers refer to it as the age of Aquarius. Perhaps in the distant future, though, social critics will look back upon the time we are approaching and will call it the age of androgyny. There is no thing 
there is nothing. Why did she say that? Because that's Buddha. What she's saying is, we've had too much rationalism, we've had too much masculine thinking, and it's time to bring in the other side of just intuition. So we're going to blank out our objective mind. Rational thinking must go out the window. So she quotes Buddha here. The androgen has been nearly totally expunged from the Judeo Christian tradition. We see much evidence of the trend toward androgyny in our Western world. The deeply moving spirit of androgyny is not yet obvious. See, she's laughing. She's saying, folks haven't even caught on. Well, we've got hippies. We've we, we got this whole rock culture. We've got Woodstock. We've got Led Zeppelin. We, we, we've got the homosexual. We've we got the women becoming masculine and leaving their place. And, and people don't even understand. It's the whole spirit. She said it's not yet obvious. What she's implying is pretty soon it's going to be obvious what this whole thing has been about. I've told you stories of... Uh, putting out flyers back in my rock band days and talking about we're not again uh, we're not for this new homosexual punk rock stuff and come see our band you know and and uh, and, and all these people started coming over to me and saying hey we're about homosexuality I'm like what, what what are you talking about aren't we into rock and roll I mean we're against this whole stuff right and they're all looking at me and said man you got to learn something don't you know where this whole train is going? And of course, it wasn't many years after that, a decade or so, that bands such as Nirvana, Buddhism, see, came out praising bisexuality. And then the whole thing exploded. So when I found out what, where the train was going, they said, yeah, don't you know what the earrings are for? Don't you know what it's all about? I tell you what, sometimes you're just a little late catching on. You understand? I think there's a lot of Baptists in America that have not yet caught on to what this whole thing's about. They think they're being cool. You're not being cool. Well, maybe you are. But you need to understand what cool means. It's not yet obvious, even though it's older than history itself. Yes, it's the ancient pagan homosexual ideal that destroyed Greece, destroyed Rome. Everywhere it has existed as the hidden river. Wow. Even in the Judeo christian culture, androgyny has periodically come to light. Yes, we've seen that in the art and that type of thing. It's certainly in the Christian culture today. But until now, it has not gained sufficient strength to reassume its original primacy over the patriarchal powers in our society. The women's movement may turn out to be the divisive step in the direction of androgyny. I'm not sure that many women know where the path is leading. Isn't that true? See, so you've got people that are awake. They're on the wrong side. But they see what's happening. They're discerners of the times, even though they're on the wrong side. And many of the women that they're using to go destroy the family and destroy patriarchy and create the new bisexual androgynous creature. They don't even know what they're doing. They think they're standing for women's rights. They had no idea that they're part of a bigger satanic agenda that's been going on ever since the devil corrupted Eve in the book of Genesis and told her to leave her place. Bringing Adam as the passive grabbed by his nose, led along, even though the Bible said he was not deceived and he knew what he was doing was wrong. See, from the very beginning, the devil has been creating that corruption. A new consciousness is rising out of the morass of a declining society. The new orientation that is gaining influence may be characterized as emphasizing what? Feminine values. There it is. So when Christianity becomes worldly, it begins to mimic the world. And now that the world is uh, embracing these uh, Aquarian feminine values, and, and some feminine values are good, 
But when we use them, for example, when you say that you need to be charitable and forgiving, but Paul said when that man fornicated, you need to exclude him from the church. And that was real love. That was confrontational love, tough love. And the Bible had a balance of these things. But when we get unbalanced in our society today, and you begin to exalt the one to the expense of the other, in other words, even the promise keepers were very imbalanced. They, they would write books saying, what do I do when my son comes home with an earring in his ear? And they begin to say, well, you need to be thoughtful. And you need to just pat him on the back, you know, and just, uh, you know, don't get in the way and just let him uh, do whatever he wants to do. And, and I'm thinking, this is supposed to be masculinity? But they were trying. They were trying to some degree. But they were still drunk with the whole culture of feminism in ways they had not even realized. We have a culture that has exalted feminine values and Christianity is aping it. Punishment is bad. Correction is bad. Reproof is bad. A God who punishes and sends people to hell is bad. We don't want a God of fear. We don't want any. We don't want discipline in our church. We don't want discipline in our homes. This is where we're at. Many Christians are drunk with the world and don't even know what hit them. Many, even some who are not of a fundamental Christian worldview, have discerned this war on men and boys, especially as the feminization agenda became more obvious. The editors of Look Magazine authored the decline, the decline of the American male in 1958. The first chapter is titled, Why Do Women Dominate Him? I'm not so sure if they're just mocking the whole thing altogether, but it's interesting that they wrote this little book Showing in 1958, look what happened to the men. They're being dominated. So much more could be said, but hurrying along in 1998, John G. Thixton authored the little booklet, Barriers to Sodomy, Biblical Principles for, Pres for Preserving Children from Perversion. He shows how biblical authority in the home Biblical distinction between the sexes, biblical discipline, biblical, biblical work ethic, pure influences are all crucial defenses against the homosexual feminist agenda. It's a good little book. In the year 2000, Christina Hoff Sommers authored The War Against Boys. She's not a Christian fundamentalist. But she wrote a book called The War Against Boys, How Misguided Feminism is Harming Our Young Men. She shows how public schools, psychology, everything in our society is working together to create effeminate young boys. Shy. Weak. Apathetic. More recently, Paul Coughlin, Colin, or however you pronounce it, Coolin, authored No More Christian Nice Guy. Why Being Nice Instead of Good Hurts Men, Women, and Children, 2005. Interest, interesting title. It wasn't a bad book. In the same year, David Murrow authored Why Men Hate Going to Church. This is coming out of the promise keeper awakening that we have an imbalance in our churches. Something is wrong. The churches are ruled by women. They're being taken over. Something is wrong in our churches. And these men are at least seeing some of it. Unfortunately... Although filled with much that is needful, these latter works only scratch the surface and often miss the root of the problem. Much like the Promise Keepers movement itself, which tried to fix what is wrong with men, but in the context of ecumenicalism, psychobabble, compromise, and feminist interpretation of the Scriptures. So, 
you have this big, giant men's movement. And I know they've been criticized by the other side. I'm criticizing them for other reasons. They would stand up and they would say, let's have Mormons and everybody in our men's movement. Okay, now wait a minute. If we're supposed to be men, shouldn't we be contending for the faith? Not only that, but psychology is creating effeminate men. And all the psychobabble that's in your books and, and all of that, all of that is the, the reason we ended up in this mess to begin with. You can't fix men with the same psychobabble that messed them up to begin with. And then this feminist interpretation of Scripture. Interpreting Ephesians 5 as mutual submission and such like. Well, where does all of this come from? Saying that the good father is, is going to stand back and just allow his home to go to hell. And, and how is that Jacob standing up when he got revival and saying, uh, cleanse your garments, you know, change your garments, and we're going up to the house of God. And it's time for us to get right. We're going to get right in my home. And he began to purify his house. Nevertheless, the books admit that there is a problem. And thankfully, many are awakening to it. My question is this. Will there be enough manliness to actually accomplish anything other than talk? Will enough people awake to manliness to save the children? I'm at this little bit of awakening to manliness. Not going anywhere near far enough. I wrote one of the authors. I said, all you've done is discovered fundamentalism. But yet you're trying to demonize fundamentalism. And that's the whole root of, of everything that you're trying to discover right now. So really what these books represent is an evangelical awakening. Will enough people awake to manliness to save the children? You know, I know that there's some men left. And I know some men might be manly in some areas of their life, but not manly in other areas of their life. I was thankful to hear the report of, they call him a security guard, but the family organization issued a statement that he was more than just a security guard. He just runs some security for him. He wasn't even armed. But when that homosexual activist broke in, intending to shoot a whole bunch of people, he didn't even have a weapon. And he took a shot in his arm, disarmed the fellow, and saved everybody's life. That was a manly act. That was a good thing for that man to do. And all around the country... If we would inspire people to manliness, you would not have people walking around. They might get one person, but you would have men stand up and take care of business. But they go wherever they know there's no guns and there is a climate of passivity. That's where they go. So as we see these books and many others being written trying to show that something is wrong today, let us pray that we as a church, not only in our own individual homes, but we as a church can wake up to true biblical manliness and do what's right and save our children. Joshua said in Joshua 24, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He's made a decision. He didn't ask anybody, did he? You think he went home and asked his children if that's all right? You think he did?
1 Corinthians 16. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Is that in the Bible? There it is right there. Quit means not to quit. I think God uses King's English so you'll remember it. There's two types of quit. And they're opposites. This quit means don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Do your duty. Get the job done. He means take care. Overcome whatever God providentially puts before you. Don't let the devil bring you down. Don't say you can't take it anymore. I like to read about Paul because Paul says, I have fears within. Isn't that something? Paul said, I have fears within. He says, I have the care of the churches. I have persecution. I have tribulation. I got all this. And I got fears within me. If you're a real man, you're human. There's going to be temptations to fear. There's going to be all types of things that the devil puts in your mind. Being a man is taking your fear and doing the right thing because it's right in spite of those fears. That's what courage is. Not being overwhelmed. Not allowing those fears to keep you from doing the right thing or the thing that God has set before you to do. That's what courage is. So in part two of this study, we will explore and review some moral foundations and even look at some physical dietary areas so that we may be successful in raising not only straight boys, but masculine godly young men who will stand against and confront the wickedness in this modern culture. Psalms 127 says his arrows are in the hand of a mighty man. What type of man? Mighty man. So are children of the youth. I believe this is saying it takes a man to raise godly children. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not. In other words, I see people, you know, I've got five children, and everywhere I go, people come up and they say, you know, you got a nice family, beautiful family, praise, you know, and, and they say things, they say it must be rough. And, you know, I think of this word. No, happy is the man. Happy is the man. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That's public. So what the Bible just said is a mighty man, a masculine man, a manly man, the one that fears the Lord and has some backbone, he's going to raise children that are going to contend against this culture. They're going to speak with the enemies in the gate. They're going to confront this culture. Isn't that good? I mentioned a note about Jacob and Esau, and we'll go ahead and talk about that for a moment. You know, I was thinking about this. I do believe that there's not only a spiritual assault upon our boys, I believe there's an environmental assault upon our boys. And we'll talk about that next week, and we talked about it before, God willing. But although Jacob was a smooth son, I don't believe he was drinking out of any plastic bottles, do you? No, I don't think he had any plastic bottles. I don't believe he's eating beans out of a can. I believe in porridge and stuff. He didn't have BPA lining his canned food, did he? No. But some boys are just going to be genetically different. Some are going to be smooth. Some are going to be hairy, you know, and that type of thing. And he's contrasted to his brother, the hairy hunter. But what I don't want you to miss is Jacob was exceptionally strong. He was physically fit. I think that's important. 
It says in Genesis 29, He said, Lo, it is yet high day, neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. What are ye the sheep? And go and feed them. And they said, We cannot. And so all the flocks be gathered together till they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. And while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. What's one thing we know about Rachel from Jacob's perspective? Huh? She was pretty. Now, I noticed Jacob didn't care about necessarily taking that big giant stone off the well's mouth. But it says in verse 9, While he yet spake with them, Rachel came. Oh, suddenly now. Suddenly now. It came to pass. And the Bible is sure to tell you this. When he saw Rachel, when he saw Rachel, <laughs> the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. So, it seemed that Jacob did have some manly physical strength. He had to learn some inner moral strength. But even by the end, he was wrestling with God. And the Bible said he did prevail. Amen? So he, had to, he was a wimp inside, internally, and he had to learn some moral fortitude. But uh, he had some physical ability, even though he was a smooth man. And I think that's good. Now, it took, Jacob, it took Rachel to, to basically get him moving. But I do think that that's... Uh, you know, the Jews, historically, they like that. Because they say, you know, this shows that we're strong as a race, you know. And they like to look at Jacob here exercising that strength, you know. And uh, many commentators have said that they believe that stone uh, could have took a couple of men to move. You know, at least easily. And Jacob walked right on over and moved it. Now, how does that relate to our discussion here? I don't want us to get the wrong idea. And this is what these forefathers tried to do. They wrote these books talking about David and his physical abilities and things. And they wanted you to get a balanced view of these men and not get this wrong idea of as if being a Christian means that you need to be a monk or a nun or some ascetic uh, Gnostic letting your body waste away unable to defend anybody. That's not God's view of Christianity. In spite of the fact that in certain situations, He certainly commanded us to be patient and turn the other cheek. Uh, we have a few moments. We've been through a lot. We've been through uh, the whole foundation of how we got here. So I want to use next week, God willing to not deal with the moral foundations and propaganda and how we got to the situation that we're in. I want to just talk about some practical things we can do to be men and raise godly children. And um, even, if it's just, even if it's not informing you of anything, but simply reminding you. But you know, I'm going to prime the pump, so to speak, right now and just see if you have any thoughts about raising godly, manly children in these perilous times.